Welcome in everyone to the State for Day podcast. I'm your host Lisa Matthews bringing you all things AZ and today on the show we have a fourth generation Arizonan here in the house. I'm a fourth as well. Yay! Lena Spottelson. There you AKA go. Lena Karina. <laughs> That's what we're going to call her here today. <laughs> but she is just an all-around badass, native of the Valley, like I said, a cancer survivor, which we're going to get into her incredible story, and director of the American Cancer Society. So we are so excited to have you here today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited so. to be here. And I know that we have partnered in the past. Yes. We're good friends here at State 48. Mm-hmm. But really, your story, before I even really, truly knew that, um, I was just captivated by you on Instagram. I ain't going to lie. I was scrolling Instagram, <laughs> she popped up, and I was like, yo, she's beautiful. Like, Aww. I need to look at who is she. Popped on your pictures, and then I everything just, like, came across. I was like, oh, my gosh, she's a survivor. And I looked into your story a little bit more. Oh, my gosh, she's a basketball coach. You just were so captivating, and I knew that you'd be a perfect fit for this show beyond just being an amazing partner with us. So thank you. I'm excited, but I'm going to learn more about you because we're going to do a quick little game. Yep. To uh, start I love games. games. Yay. <laughs> it's really easy. Please don't sound so confident. She's like, uh, I'm not gonna put you on the spot. These are all things you know. Okay. Hopefully. About Good. Yourself. Cross my fingers. <laughs> uh, first question. My favorite quote is. My favorite quote is actually a song lyric by Gary Allen and it's Life ain't always beautiful, but it's a beautiful ride. Mm, I like that. Mm-hmm. Do you sing? Uh, not very well. <laughs> I sing all the time, but not okay. very well. Same. <laughs> uh, I want to be remembered for? I want to be remembered for being a positive influence in people's lives. Okay. If I could be anyone for a day, I would be? Anyone, huh? Mm-hmm. Hmm, I would be, whew, that's a tough one. I would be, I know this is going to sound weird, but I'm a huge basketball fan. I would be Devin Booker. Boom. (laughs) Yes. The swag, the cars, the game. The being able to travel, the amount of skill he has in a basketball court. I mean, just being a lifelong basketball fan and having that kind of talent is, would be. Right. Incredible to me. That's a great one. I yeah. guess that'd be Charles Barkley if we're picking Suns players. <laughs> Round man and rebound. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's actually like low key, actually high key. I talk about it all the time. He's my like ultimate person. Yeah. If I, yes, he is my, he growing up, obviously born and raised here, mm-hmm. love the Suns, uh, was my imaginary friend. Imaginary. I'm obsessed with him. <laughs> like, it's weird. I'm 33. I'm a grown ass adult now, and yeah, I'm still yeah, obsessed yeah. with him. My 34th birthday is going to be Charles Barkley themed. I love it. Everyone has to come looking like Charles Barkley. <laughs> Let's start tagging him in things. I bet he'd come. I bet he'd show up. You know what? This whole degree of like, I've, I've been so close to people who are his best friends. Yeah. You know, just know him, golf with him. Uh-huh. You've have never a met run him? In. I have met him once. Okay. But have like random run-ins with him. Yeah. And they'll tell me like, hey, I just saw Charles Barkley at the car wash. I'm like, when am I going to see him at the car wash? That's hilarious. It doesn't happen. He's very nice. Very. He's very. He's hilarious. Can you get him on the pod or what do we Can you get, can you? No, I I I just want to like hug him. (laughs) So my mom worked for the Suns for 35 years. She just retired last July. And um, so she knows, you know, the players. She's assistant to the owner. Um, But she's really good friends with. Uh, do you know who um, Joanne Fitzsimmons is? Yes. She's really good. So tra- wow. my mom and Joanne are really good friends. And obviously Joanne is yeah. a good friend of Charles. Yeah. Okay, so, so I've met I, her. I met him through Joanne a few times. Okay. So there's a chance. I have another there, connect there's, that hasn't come through with me. <laughs> I met him, but I, I was very new in you know my job with uh-huh. Fox Sports Arizona. I was a, basically an intern and they sent me out to an event yeah. to interview and I'm like what me oh my god and I'm so nervous sweating pits mm-hmm. got my question into him and they all knew I was obsessed with him so yeah. they're like this is a big moment and so someone like had turned around and said hey get a picture real quick and I'm just like oh my god. but I legit in kindergarten my show and tell I had a cut out of him and I took it to school and said I, I met him and I didn't so <laughs> I just have a weird thing going on which I love it get to meet him Charles if you're watching call me you know who I am. <laughs> I feel like enough people have told him now. Like, there's this really crazy little Mexican girl that's obsessed with 
<laughs> that is hilarious. That's going to be my one new day. goal in life, to get Charles Barkley to your birthday party. So one time, oh, this podcast is already off the rails. It's but next, <laughs> next month, right? How, do we, how many days do we have until your birthday? Oh, it's a, a month from now. Yeah, okay. he's coming to my birthday. So how many days do we have? Throw it out in the universe. It's yeah. a blue It's a blue, super, blue super moon okay, tonight. So his best friend, who used to play for the Cardinals, FaceTimed me while he was with him, and I had just given birth. What are the chances? Oh. Was like in the days of like, yeah. And I'm like looking at the FaceTime, knowing it's Charles Barkley on the other. Oh end. my goodness! And I'm like, I just can't not like this. <laughs> so maybe one day, Charles. All right, I'm crossing my fingers. I love it because right you understand basketball. Yeah, fan. I do. You I know, do. The obsession is it's real. <laughs> it's a real obsession. So moving on to the next question: uh, favorite sports team. So any any Arizona sports team is is my favorite. Um, but growing up being a basketball fan, the Phoenix Suns would be yeah, yeah. my number one choice. The jam. Yeah. And something most people don't know about me is um, I I put on there uh, that I'm a stage four cancer survivor. But I they always do this thing where tell me an interesting fact about yourself in in groups. And one of the things that I always say is, do you know who Gerardo is? You might be a little young, but Rico Suave. Yes. yes okay, so Rico yes. Suave. So Gerardo and my sister actually knew each other. Okay. And he came into town to promote a new album that was coming out. And he needed backup dancers. So I was a one-time backup dancer for Gerardo. No, you weren't. At Axis Radius. <laughs> what? Axis <laughs> Radius? <laughs> we are going back, back. I know. People don't even know what that is. Yeah. These days. Yeah, it's wow. just the two of us. Do you remember your moves? No, absolutely not. But, you know, it was like, what was it, not in the 90s? So I'm sure our outfits looked fantastic. We danced. Do you have any type of footage? I need receipts. I'm going to see <laughs> if my sister has anything. But, yeah, I don't we'll know how she knew Gerardo in. even. We'll need to cue it in for the teaser. This <laughs> yeah, here. this is the teaser. So you and your sister are backup dancers. For Gerardo, yep. Was, was it one time. intense, like training? Did you? What happened <laughs> was this was, and this was post Rico Suave. It was his new album, right? Okay. So it was his new, his new cassette that he had coming out. But he they, he sent us a single beforehand to make up a dance. So that, <laughs> you're already laughing. <laughs> a tape, <laughs> a cassette. So they, they said he sends us the single, and we make up this whole dance. And then I don't know what happens. And then my sister was like, you know what? Maybe you should bring some other people in. <laughs> so they actually brought in these other two dancers who actually performed a routine, and then we just had to do our own separate routine up on the... There was, like... So at Access Radius, there was a stage, and then there was, like, a railing. I remember. That's where we performed. <laughs> <laughs> Access Radius, 18 uh, and up. I used to hit that club. Yeah, it was great. Wow, my sidekick was stolen at Access Radius. So rude. Oh, your sidekick. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. The it's real ones, cell no. phone for the, the young real ones. Right. Yeah. The Not in existence anymore. The one that would, obviously. Potentially the loudest cell phone opening And the heaviest. Ever. Yeah. And, and the heavy. I had a whole break. Sweet games, though. I can't, yeah, stolen out of my hands. Just, wow. At access, right? Never forget. Mm -hmm. But wow, you have some really core memories there as yeah. well. <laughs> Gerardo. We need to find that, Gerardo. I'm going to find it. I don't. Even, I couldn't even tell you the single, what it was. Oh but. my gosh. That's amazing. <laughs> wow. Thank you for sharing that. That was glorious. Uh, last question. Growing up, I wanted to be a teacher. I um, knew from a very young age that I wanted to be in education. I had this amazing third grade teacher teacher who was also my fifth grade teacher um and his name was mr garcia and mr garcia i remember him making learning so much fun mm -hmm. and he kind of i was an introvert as a child and he kind of helped bring that out of my shell uh, out of me out of my shell and made um education awesome so i knew from a very young age that i wanted to be in education in fact mm -hmm. my bachelor's and my master's is in education okay did mm -hmm. you ever end up teaching or yep. using that i taught 11 years oh, wow. And then I was diagnosed in 2006 with stage four cancer and tried to, you know, went through treatment and, and all that stuff and then tried to forget that I had cancer and jump back into my life. And, and I was sitting in the, in the classroom one day, seventh grade at the middle school that I actually went to. And I remember thinking to myself, something didn't feel right. And as much as I love teaching, I knew that my life had a different purpose and that wow. my, the, the world was guiding me into a new direction. Mm. And that's how I ended up at the American Cancer Society. 
Wow. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like you've lived already like four different lives if yeah. you think about it? Definitely. When you seems say you like taught for 11 years, I'm like, you look like you're 20. So <laughs> half your life <laughs> you were a teacher and then now you've yeah. been at the American Cancer Society for how long? Since 2014. Okay. Yeah. But, a, you know, a, a piece of me was, as I love teaching. I loved, and I would, ne- I would still be teaching if I'd never gotten cancer. Um, but a part of me couldn't let that go. So I started coaching almost right when I began teaching. And um, so that was in 2003, I want to say. And I coached high school basketball for 20 years. And it was like that part of me that held on to being a teacher. Right. Mm-hmm. You're teaching, you're coaching, right. you're still exercising that part of your heart that yep. still mm-hmm. kind of yearns for that, but in a different way. Yeah. And it was good because uh, n- where I coached North High School was actually the, the high school that I attended to. So okay. I was I was teaching at the middle school that I went to and I was coaching at the high school that I attended. So it was a little part of me continuing yeah. to give back. You're deeply rooted here in mm-hmm. the valley. Yeah. Your mom, you said part of the Phoenix Suns organization. 35 years. 35 years. Yeah, 35 wow. years. And um, she is actually originally from Superior, which is about an hour east of here. My grandparents still live there. They're, they're 90 and 91, and oh, they still wow. live in the small mining town of Superior. Um, and then my dad actually went to Carl Hayden High School. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Definitely know Carl Hayden. Yeah. Wow. So then let's start with your, your journey here. So you weren't teaching, uh, you said seventh grade Mm -hmm. and then 2006 happens. So take us through kind of that journey. Yeah. 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 So, um, in 2005, so October, 2005, I actually married my husband. Um, my husband and I went to high school together. We'd been friends for a long time. Didn't date till we were in college. Mm -hmm. And, um, We were in college, we dated for four years, and then ended up getting married in October of 2005. In November of 2005, I started to get this stomach pain. We couldn't really figure out what it was. So I started going to all these doctors. At the time I was getting my master's degree, I was coaching, I just planned a wedding, everybody thought it was stress. And uh, we went to to doctors and, and, you know, they couldn't really figure out what was going on. I remember going to one doctor and that doctor told me that women, I was 26 years old at the time, Okay. Um, that women of my age were self-conscious about their bodies and prescribed me an antidepressant. You're kidding me. Nope. That doctor's still in practice today. But um, what? Yeah. So he, he did this. He was a gastroenterologist. He did an endoscopy, couldn't figure out what was wrong and said that, you know, because I was 26 that I was depressed. That's why I was sick. Um, I mean, what were your symptoms beyond stomach? Just I, stomach. I okay. had this stomach pain that started like it would start in the morning and it was like a dull stomach pain just below my belly button. Okay. And it kind of, um, you know, it started a little bit strong in the morning and then kind of died off about afternoon. Hmm. So it was still tolerable. I was still, you know, finishing my master's and coaching, all that stuff, yeah. um, coaching, teaching full time. Um, wasn't enough to put me on, you know, on my butt, but I, uh, I just, you know, I was kept fighting through it. And when the doctor told me that, or told me and my husband that, my husband was like, you know, she's never been depressed a day in her life. There's no way. And he's actually the one that encouraged me to continue to go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know any better. You know, I was 26 years old. You think growing up, these doctors know everything, right? You, you just go to the doctor, they'll, they'll tell you what's wrong. They'll give you whatever, they'll tell you what to do next, and then you'll be fine. Um, and I had never been depressed, but at the time I was like, well, maybe this is what depression feel like, feels like. I don't know what, I don't know what depression feels like. Um, so I think I took it, the antidepressant for maybe two days. And then my husband's like, absolutely not. We're not doing this. Um, so I continued to go to, to doctors, a bunch of different doctors. And I ended up, um, one doctor told me that, you know, we're going to do, we're going to do some tests, CT scans. I mean, you name it, I had it. He said, you know, it's a hun- it's one in a million chance you have cancer. We don't know what it is. So, um, but we're going to continue to do some more, some more tests. So in July, that doctor had me go to another doctor who was a friend of his at Mayo at, in, um, in Scottsdale. And that doctor called us, called us in. We went to the doctor's office, my husband and I, and I went to the doctor's office thinking that they weren't going to know what it is again, you know, Mm -hmm. that I was going to continue to, to try to find some, you know, more tests and they're going to do more tests and we're going to try these other, other medications. And he sat me down on the, 
on the bench and my, my husband was on the chair next to me and he came in and he pulled up all my scans that I had on the screens. And he looked at me and he had like sadness in his eyes. Mm. And he said, you have cancer and I'm going to show you why. And so he started pointing out all the little spots where the cancer was. And, you know, to go from, I, I knew something was wrong, but never in a million years did I think it was, you know, something as, as serious as cancer. And stage four, nonetheless. At stage that point, four. He, well, he says, he goes, um, you know, it's stage four. We got to get you into surgery right away. And he goes, and you won't be able to have children after this. So my husband, who is more emotional than I am, I know he's going to hate that I said that. Um, but he, I looked at him and he was, you could see there were tears coming down his face, which even got me even more scared. And I said, okay, you know, I was just shocked, right? What, 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 do, we ha what do we have to do? You know, at this point, I had, I had heard of cancer. There was no history of cancer in my family. I didn't know any, you know, what to do next. Obviously, I wasn't educated as I am now. And him saying stage four and we have to get you into surgery right away meant not absolutely nothing to me. I had no idea what that meant. Um, and I left there and I was just calling people. I was like, hey, you know, like, just as an FYI, I have cancer. Like, I don't even know what to say. Wow. Um, so I didn't know, you know, what treatment looked like even. So they said, okay, well, we're going to have to give you a, a radical hysterectomy. And a radical hysterectomy is when um, they have to take your uterus and other parts of your body, right? So hysterectomy is when they take just your uterus. Right. So the cancer was on my uterus, my gallbladder, my appendix, my left ovary, the top part of my cervix, and a bunch of lymph nodes down my left side. So it had metastasized to several different areas. And when it's metastasized like that, it's stage four. So about two weeks later, I go into surgery and they said, you know, it's going to be a three hour surgery, three and a half hour surgery. And we'll, we'll cut everything up and then we'll assess from there. And at the time, hospitals weren't leaving you like they would slice you open they'd cut out the parts that had cancer close you back up you get a scan and then if they needed to go in and get more you'd have another surgery mm -hmm. well at, i was at mayo which was amazing for me and they they opened me up they took out the parts that had cancer and then they would they would test additional parts to see if it was cancer oh, okay. so i think originally they thought it was maybe in two or three places and when they opened it up they realized that it was in several other additional places mm -hmm. so they gave me a a radical hysterectomy so which took away my ability to have children um that surgery ended up lasting six and a half hours because they kept finding the cancer oh my gosh and then um they closed me up and then the next day the doctor came into my office and said you're gonna you're gonna need chemo and radiation mm. and I mean I was so s naive at the time that my first question was am I going to lose my hair mm. I which so it's it's ridiculous thinking about it now because that's the ab mean, absolute last thing you need right. to worry about but when you're 26 <laughs> right mind right. you yeah I'm just like trying to put myself in that place you're thinking about the future yeah and kids mm -hmm. and you know what life had you gotten your honeymoon yet yeah I mean okay we'd so just gotten back uh-huh yeah just get back from mm -hmm. your honeymoon and then boom. Yeah. The unexpected. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I just can't even imagine how to really truly register it. When you're when you're telling the story back to me, my first initial question when I'm like hearing all this is like, do you remember these moments very vividly? Or is this like the timeline that you in a sense, almost like tell yourself like this happened, you know, you kind of protect yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. Th I remember everything um, that I said was pretty vivid. Now there's things during treatment, like because of the drugs and the chemo and, you know, me being in and out of sleep and, and, you know, and all these different things um, that I don't remember that I have to, you know, my husband has to help me, you know, did, did this happen? Did, the timeline, yeah. Right. Cause it's, you know, it's foggy to me because I was just literally trying to get through every single hour of every single day, but all those things leading up to it. Yes. I remember everything exactly. You know, I remember getting on the phone with my principal and telling her, Hey, you know, I, I have to figure something out because I won't be able to be working. I have cancer, right? I remember exactly what light I was at when I had that conversation with her. Mm. Um, I remember my sister was pregnant at the time 
and they didn't want to tell her that I had cancer. Um, she had a history of, of uh, miscarriages, and they didn't want to tell her that I had cancer because they were nervous that that your was... Your family? Yeah. That, with that, your mm-hmm, yeah. So, I mean, I remember all those things. Wow. And then after surgery, you know, they got me into... They, they gave me a very strong regimen of, of, of chemo and radiation. Um, I remember at Mayo, they do this, like, little group where they you, anybody that's newly diagnosed patient they put you in a room together and they tell you like they give you a folder and then all your chemo drugs are going to be in there right but I remember mine didn't have anything in that because they were still trying to figure out I don't basically right. how are we gonna how are we gonna help this patient mm. um and you know it's looking back and seeing all these things I'm like I, I don't think they you know they exactly knew how they were going to treat me um I had chemo radiation and then my one year anniversary is coming up in October. So after my, um, I want to say it was my first round of chemotherapy and I was, I was deep into radiation. They, uh, my, my one year anniversary, my husband and I got married in October. And so we wanted to go to Disneyland for our one year anniversary. Mm. And, um, you know, who isn't happy at Disneyland? So we wanted to go, but I was still, I was, the chemo was working through my body. So I was like nauseous. I was fragile. I was losing weight already. I wasn't, I wasn't eating very much. And we had this plan that we were going to go to Disneyland. And anybody that has knows anything about chemotherapy knows that your immune system is, you know, you have, you have no immune system. You have, you have no ability to fight off any, any infection. And the doctors were like, this is like such a bad idea. Don't go to the doctor. I mean, don't go to Disneyland and, you know, like trying to talk us out of it. And we're like, absolutely not. We're going to Disneyland. It's going to be fine. So we go to Disneyland and we, we drive, we drive up there and I still had hair. Like I was still, I, I had a short bob. I'd cut my long hair into a short bob and it was coming out, you know, just like stringy every once in a while. Um, but I still had hair. And my husband like drove to Disneyland. We made very few stops on the way there. We get to the hotel. And by this point, like my hair started coming out more. Like it was like all over my fingers. It was on the pillow, it was in the shower. And I said, you know, I I can't do this anymore. I said, go to to Target across the street, go get the clippers. I said, I'm done. I I don't want this all over me anymore. And uh, he goes across the street And that morning, the day, the day of our anniversary, that morning before we went to Disneyland, he laid out newspaper on the floor and Mm. I sat down on it and he shaved my head. Wow. Yep. And so on our our one year anniversary, he shaved my head and he did such a terrible job. I mean, it was. (laughs) Like, we need pictures. Did you shave his head? No, no. And and he kept (laughs) wanting to. And I was like, please, I don't want to walk around like a bunch of cone heads. (laughs) You know, like, don't shave your head. I'm good. I have the visual. (laughs) But it was so bad. Like it was, I mean, it was chunk. It looked, it looked like, you know, a five-year-old got a a hold of, of the, uh, Mm -hmm. the hair clippers. And so I put a hat on and, and if you see, I'll show you the pictures of, uh, of us in Disneyland, but I'm wearing a hat because it was like, it looked so bad. And so when we got back from Disneyland, I had my brother-in-law fix it. Please help me. Yeah. I think you should bring it back like every year on the anniversary. (laughs) Just redo it again. You know what I mean? Just start. start. Yeah. Just start your own little tradition. Yeah. It's great. Oh no. Don't do that. Don't listen to him. And anything he says, please don't listen to him. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Let's talk about fear Mm -hmm. because I feel like in those moments of getting a diagnosis or literally, quite literally, your life is on the line. Mm -hmm. Did you register that in real time, or is it something that you've had to deal with post more so? I, I would say now. Now the the funny thing about this is that when they when they diagnosed me at some point, they had a conversation with my husband by himself, and I I don't, I don't remember this, but um, at no point did I ever think that I wasn't going to survive. Mm-hmm. At no point, I, I I thought you know, you know, then that's part of me being naive, and you know, I was. They, I thought that the doctor was telling me what to do, and as long as I followed what the doctor did, then I was going to be fine. But at some point during um, my doctor, or my husband went with me to every single doctor's appointment, you know, asked a bunch of questions. I always told him, stop asking questions. I just want to get out of here. But um, he would always ask a bunch of questions, and at some point they, they gave, they told him that, you know, her chances of survival are about 25%. And um, thankfully, I didn't know that. I, I had no idea. Um, I think there's power in that. Yeah. 
And some people were like, oh, you know, they're telling the husband that 25, I was like, listen, like, that's not something that you want to tell a cancer patient as they're going through treatment, like literally, and then people will Google it now, but they tell you to stay off the internet. Um, but I, at no point did, did I ever fear that I wouldn't make it except for now after my third round of chemo, um, like I said, your body can't find off infection. I got a, an infection and I went into septic shock. My husband actually, oh my God. yeah, so a nurse saved my life. Her name's Chi, um, and I'll never forget Chi, but I had Chi a couple of times because after every chemo, I would end up in the hospital. You know, your body's literally getting poisoned. And um, I went in, I, I had been vomiting, I couldn't stop. It was the only time I had vomited the whole time during treatment. And I went into the, uh, to the hospital and Chi happened to be in the infusion room. And she said, hey, you know, how's it going? I was like, I, I don't feel good. And she's like, you know, this isn't normal for you to be vomiting like this. She calls the doctor and tells the doctor. Doctor says, you know, is she running a fever? She's like slight, but you, you always run a slight fever when you're going through chemotherapy. And he's like, give her Tylenol, send her home. And so she, uh, she's like, oh, I don't feel right. You know, so she put an IV in me to hydrate me and she kept me there. She actually kept me there for eight hours. Call the doctor again, convince the doctor to give me a blood culture. Blood culture takes 48 hours to get the results back. So they take your blood, they cook it, and then when they cook it, infection, like it'll, mm. they'll tell you what kind of infection it is. Well, my infection was so strong that I got it back less than 24 hours later. I was at home watching Young and the Restless, eating an apple, and um, the doctor calls and they're like, you have an infection, you need to get to the hospital right away. And I'm like, okay, you know, everybody's over dramatic. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get to the hospital. You're like, let me finish my episode right, and right. finish my apple, by I the way. I felt fine. Like I at this point I felt fine. <gasps> you know, IVs always make you feel better. So my husband was getting ready to, to get a haircut and you know, he, he was at the door and I was like, Hey, the doctor called and said that I need to go to the hospital, but go get your haircut because you know, if we go, we're going to be there for three Why days. Why are you so chill, girl? <laughs> you guys <laughs> You're over here with stage four cancer right. and an infection, eating your damn apple. Right. <laughs> eating my apple, watching and the rest was happy as a clam. Oh my gosh. And I go, just go. You, we're going to be there for three days. You know, you're not going to be able to get your hair. Just go. And then my husband was literally at the door and he's like, no, I don't feel right about this. I'm going to take you to the hospital. So he takes me to the hospital. I walk in. They go, we have a room for you. And I'm like, okay. So I get to the room and then all, all of a sudden my heart starts to hurt. And I, I turned to the nurse. I'm not even dressed. I think I was wearing like Juicy Couture or something, right? I was wearing a fuzzy Was it a fuzzy real sweatsuit. Juicy no, Couture? Definitely from Target. It? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a backstory to that. <laughs> we'll tell you later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I walk in and I'm not even changed in the hospital gown. And she's like, okay, lie down. So I lie down and she gets an EKG machine. She comes in. She puts all these things on my on my heart. And she's monitoring my heart. She puts a blood pressure cuff on me. And I look to my left and I see that my blood pressure is 40 over 20. And I black out. And uh, this is where I have to rely on my husband for, for the rest of this. But I guess they hit a code from behind my bed. They flip me upside down. And all these nurses came rushing in to try to push water through me so that they could the blood could go to my head and to my heart to keep me alive. And I wake up in ICU and I can't breathe. So I lost, I don't know how much time where they were trying to revive me. Um, I wake up in ICU and I can't breathe and I'm, you know, I'm like huffing and puffing. And the infection was so bad that it got into my lungs. And like I said, went into septic shock. And they came in and they said, they made my husband sign a paper. You know, here he is newly married and now his hand, his, my life is in his hands, right? And they were like, you need to sign this. The doctor says, you need to sign this document so that we can put her on a ventilator because she will not survive. And so my husband signs it for everything else, every doctor's appointment, every other question, every medication that the doctors um, prescribed, Ryan would read, my husband would read all the, you know, everything about the medication, everything about everything that I was going through. And that doctor said, no, if you don't sign it now, she's not going to survive. So, um, he signs a document, they hold my arms down and they, they put me in a, in a ventilator and a drug induced coma. And that night they told my husband that I wouldn't make it through the night. So my family all came down, the waiting room was filled with my family and friends, you know, trying to probably going to say their last goodbyes. And um, 
about four days later, I came out from over the the anesthesia, and uh, the doctor the doctors couldn't believe it. To be honest with you, they, they couldn't believe it. They didn't think that I would I would make it over that twenty four hours. Oh my God. husband had gotten me to the hospital just in time. Oh. If he would have gotten his haircut, I would have I would died at home. Truly, mm-hmm. I I have a question. Yeah, um, how yeah, do because you? Because I can't contain myself. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, this is amazing. First of all, yeah. first and foremost, this is amazing. Um, <laughs> how do you? How do you maintain trust in, like, mm. you, you, I don't know how to ask this question, I apologize. Yeah. How do you maintain trust in the hospital with some of the other situations that have occurred? A doctor trying to just give you Advil and send you home, like, yeah. that would have killed you. Mm-hmm. Telling you that you just have depression, like, that yeah. would have killed you. Yeah, like, truly. But at the same time, like, you're in a situation, you have to trust them because these situations are so dire, too. Do you ever have this? Have you already gone back and have these complexes and stuff like that with yourself. Yeah. And, um, and that's something that, you know, that I try to preach now. I think that, that's, yeah, that's kind of yeah. where my question is yeah, yeah. going to, because you still deal with so many different Correct. cancer patients. How right. do you tell yeah. this story? And like, I mean, just the absolute negligence of like, give her some Advil. Like that's right. Great. Give her some Advil. That's that's, <gasps> I'm over here. Like, ah, and see, I'm the person like, I overthink too much yeah. and I'm, I'm the drama. Like uh-huh. you're like, you're being dramatic. Hubby. Like I yeah. am the drama. I am yeah. like, what is this? Tell me all the facts. My yeah. husband's a paramedic and he's like nonchalant. Like yeah. He's just like, it's fine. You're gonna be fine. I'm like, I'm going to die. Yeah. So that's a great question yeah. to, I think also that helps you be such an advocate for the families Correct. that you encounter. Yeah. And in, 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 and part of my job, like the majority of my job is to get companies, corporations, to engage with the American Cancer Society, but also part of that job is to make sure that they know of our patient, you know, our services, our our programs and services that we offer to cancer patients. But a lot of people find me outside of my job on social media. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't public for a long time. I was a private account, and then when I started speaking, telling my story, I understood. I understood that other people probably needed to hear it. You know, a lot of times people get diagnosed with cancer. And they just want to know that somebody worse off than them survived. They just want to provide that little bit of, uh, they want that little bit of hope. And so that's why I started to go public and share my, my story more often. But there is a movement, you know, now, and they are a lot of young women are diagnosed or not heard when they're going into these doctor's appointments. And that's something that I preach now is, and we talk about all the time with the American Cancer Society is to be your own advocate, you know, and the more stories that get told, the more, um, you know, knowledge that we can give people in the community, the more of an advocate they're going to be for themselves when they go into these doctor's offices. And, you know, we've done a lot of training, especially with um, the American Cancer Society. We work with hospitals and say, you know, here, here are some resources, here are some guidance, but it's really up to them to then distribute that to their patients. Mm -hmm. So the more that we can be vocal about those things, um, the more educated patients are when they go into these doctor's appointments. But there is like, like I said, there is a movement about, you know, women not being young women, Mm -hmm. not being heard when they're going and talking about their ailments, whatever it is, and not just in in cancer, but in in really everything. Mm. You know, it's very quick for a lot of doctors. And, um, and I think it's better now, but especially back then, it was very quick for a lot of doctors to be like, hey, you know, that sounds like depression. Let me slip you some antidepressants. Yep. Mm-hmm. Wow. And there was an issue that I had in 2020 where I had some issue with my hormones and I, I knew something wasn't right. Same thing. I went to the doctor. Doctor told me, mm, sounds like you're depressed. Right. And I remember, and I'm not an emotional person at all. I remember sitting in there crying because it felt like I was having deja vu Mm -hmm. again. They're not listening to me. I know something's wrong. I'm not depressed. Same thing. He prescribed me antidepressants ended up being, I I just had too much estrogen in me. It was just like significant amount. And, um, another doctor had had to figure that out for me. Wow. Yeah. So it's, it's, I mean, it still happens now, but I think we're doing a better job. I think society is, the community is doing a better job advocating for themselves and saying, you know what, this isn't right. And the things we have to remember are doctors give opinions. They're not hard facts. Mm -hmm. That's why they call it an opinion. And it's always good to get a second or third one. Right. Well, thank God for you just being able to, one, share your story and have, you know, use your platform to now educate people Mm -hmm. in this because I'm sure and I'm certain that you have saved lives without even knowing and I think back to these moments, like very vivid moments of 
the nurse following that gut feeling of, yep. I'm going to keep her an extra mm-hmm. minute or two here, mm-hmm. or else you would have just been on your way, and how that could have changed the trajectory yep. in so many ways. Nurses save lives. They see that patient. They save lives all the time. Right. Because mm-hmm. it's just a phone call. No yep. offense to the doctors out there. Love and respect. Love it's doctors. Just, it's just a phone call. <laughs> truly, it's just a phone call. Right. At the end of the day. Right. Like when I was given birth, the doctor came in for the last. <laughs> right. I don't even think he helped me <laughs> deliver the baby. But like, but it's true. He was supervising. Like, and then it's like, okay, here, <laughs> now we're going to do this, this, that. And like, again, mad respect. I know that there are doctors out there that do it correctly. Yeah. But how do you kind of implement um, that trust and that like going through your story, obviously, you know, being an advocate for yourself yeah. and your health. But that trust throughout the process for these patients and these families that you might encounter. You know, a lot of times people will reach out and they'll like ask me for specific recommendations about doctors. Um, and I've been in the industry long enough to to be able to tell you know which doctors are are good bedside manner mm-hmm. doctors, right? That'll listen to you. That'll sit there and and be able to walk through all the ailments with with you. Um, but I will tell you that. You know, it's still it's still something that that kind of haunts me, right? Mm-hmm. So I have I have hesitancy going into a new doctor. Um, I stick with the doctors. In fact, I I don't do anything. I don't go to any doctor outside of Mayo because Mayo was the one that found my cancer. They're the ones that were thorough with everything that they did, and they saved my life. Saved your life. Um, when I when I started dealing with the hormone issue, I did go see a natural path, but it took me a while to find the natural path that I was going to be the most comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And the one that I thought knew enough to be able to help me in the situation that I, that I was in, especially being a young cancer survivor. So, um, I'm very leery about who I let diagnose me or who I'm going to go see. Mm -hmm. Um, you won't catch me at nothing against, you know, the, family practices or clinics or anything like that, but you won't do that just because of the history that I've been through. You know, I'm, I got a little PTSD from it. So I want to go to the people that know, you know, what they're doing and that I trust with giving me advice for what I'm doing. But if there's anything, and I tell this all the time with any of these patients or any of these people that reach out and they're having trouble with their doctor, I tell them, go get a second opinion Mm -hmm. always. And if you don't like that one, go get a third because you have to be comfortable with the doctor that you're you're going to go see and that's going to be ultimately in charge of saving your life you went through three stints of chemo Mm -hmm. is that what you said i was supposed to have four four yeah but i had three because of the sepsis they told me no more your body's not going to take anymore so we're not going to put you through that in fact um that was december when all that happened i was supposed to have a fourth one at the i think i want to say it was the end of december and then they said you know your body can't take another chemo so we're going to scan you in january and we're going to see where we're at. That's what they told me. January. We're going to see where we're at. January of 2007. And um, they scanned me. And I, to be honest with you, looking back, I, don't, I think they were, they were surprised. Because they were like, uh, there's no, yeah, we, there's, no, there's no cancer. We, there's no cancer cells that are detected. So then from there, they test you every three months. And then it goes to every six months. Then it goes to every year. And then I celebrated my 17-year cancer anniversary in July. Wow. That's amazing. I mm-hmm. think that's when I found you. You were trending. She was trending. <laughs> and I was like, who She's is? She's been trending. She has been <laughs> trending. Um, no, that's how I found her on Instagram, truly. And then I put it all together with State 48 yeah. and our partnership. And I'm like, whoa. Yeah. Like my mind. Yeah. Is how long have we been working with you? It's 2017. 2017. Yeah, okay. mm-hmm. That makes sense. So yeah. my... Where I want to go next is the second life that you now live yeah. post cancer. But truly, my question is, you know, and I would ask this to probably any cancer survivor: like, when do you feel finally free of that mentally? Yeah, without the fear of is it coming back? And th- and that's a question I get asked all the time. Um, I have a friend that is two years out, and that's something that you know we talk about all the time. Like, does this get easier when you go get your scans? Does it get easier? And I say, you know, the, the time of that you're, you're riddled with anxiety gets easier. It does get better with time. Um, but I will be honest with you, you know, every time I have to go to the doctor to get a mammogram or one of my regular screenings, you know, I get anxiety. I just don't get it for 
weeks before I get my mammogram and for weeks after. Mm -hmm. um, it's the day before I think about it. And I'm like, okay, I got to get my mammogram. And then I'm, you know, a little anxious. Got to drink a little more wine afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Calm myself down okay. until I get the results. Um, but it, it never, it's truly a part of you for the rest of your life. And I think that's why a lot of survivors connect because they know how it feels. And it's not just with, with, with cancer, right? It's with any, you know, ailment that somebody's going through. You know, you always have that anxiety. It's always gonna be a part of you. Um, but you learn to, to channel that into different things. Mm -hmm. And the more that people talk about their stories, the more healing they feel, the more that they realize that they're not alone. And I think that's the most important thing is that you realize you're not alone and that there's other people like you and you're not going through this by yourself. Truly. Mm -hmm. So what came up for you when you you talked about you wanted to go back to the classroom, you tried that, but you felt this pull mm -hmm. to honestly be able to share your story and help others yeah. after going what you know through what you've gone through. Mm -hmm. uh, so talk about that transition and how you ended up with the American Cancer Society. Yeah, I, I, s I was sitting in my classroom one day and I just felt like something didn't feel right. And I, and I knew it. And like I said, I'm not an emotional person. Um, and that day I was, I, I was crying and I couldn't figure out why. I was like, I just, I don't know. And you know, I think part of it was at the time I didn't really deal with having cancer. I was like, okay, I had cancer that I'm over. Now I'm trying to jump back into my life again. But the mm -hmm. fact of the matter is that you changed, mm -hmm. right? And whether you like it or not, you, you know, you have a different outlook on life. Your, your life is different. You, you just went through all this trauma. Um, and I remember crying and, and I kept, you know, just asking like, you know, what, what, what do I need to change here? Just, you know, help me figure this out. And it just hit me one day. I was like, okay, your life has a different purpose now. You know, at the time your life was to, you know, educate the young ones and help them become, you know, good, great adults and successful in whatever they were. But now your life has taken on a different role and it was time to, to share that. So I, I actually researched a bunch of companies and I knew that if I was going to leave what I love to do, which was, was, was teaching that I was going to need to work for a company that was doing the most in the, in the cancer space. And mm. that is the American cancer society. So I, I researched and I applied for jobs and, um, started out at the bottom at the American cancer society, worked my way up and, um, you know, happy to, to be a part of a, a organization that touches lives every single day and saves people's lives every mm. single day. So She's a director, y'all. She didn't mention that. <laughs> Title is here. <laughs> director. <laughs> director, But it's yep. the climb with yep. the passion mm -hmm. and the willingness and want to serve people. Yep. And I think that purpose. And I think it's so courageous, too, leaving something that you wanted to be growing up. Yeah. And then finding a new purpose and stepping into that, mm -hmm. you know. And, gosh, it's, you're able to save and serve so many at the same time. Yep. It's just, I mean, truly grateful. I, I would never, obviously, I'd never would want cancer, but truly grateful for what that time in my life has, has given me, you know, a new outlook on life. People that I, I never would have met, um, serve other survivors that mm -hmm. are, you know, doing incredible things and living these incredible lives and, you know, and learning how to be happy again. It's truly amazing to watch my survivor friends come out of that rut into the lives that they're supposed to have. And mm -hmm. it's, I'm lucky to be able to witness that stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you live your life differently after? Uh, one of the things that I always say is that um, I, I I get to like a, a, a festival or something that I never thought a game, right? I love watching sports and I get to a game and it, you know, truly amazing or a music festival. I went to Stagecoach a couple years back and I remember stopping mm -hmm. and looking around and being like, just really truly appreciative for being able to be there. And I'm like, I could have not been here right now. You know, mm. this is something that I couldn't have, ex I, I, I wouldn't have been able to experience if I would have passed away. So my thing always is to live in the present, you know, to enjoy what's being put in front of you and to every day celebrate something. Mm -hmm. So every day I celebrate something. Wow. What did you, you celebrate today? Uh, I, I was gonna ask her, no. I'm trying to make her cry over here. <laughs> Work. She said, I am not, I'm over here crying for you. It's not. <laughs> okay, so what did you celebrate today? So um, my my dad is recently, actually recently a, a cancer survivor. Wow. So we're going to celebrate him. Yep. He, he ha was diagnosed with prostate cancer about a year ago. And um, they thought he was cancer free. And then 
he had to go through treatment because the cancer came back and we got the news that he is officially cancer free. Wow. Again. So that that's what we're so celebrating amazing. today. Do you guys ring the bell today and all the things? He or? rang it. So he rang it after he was done with radiation. Okay. And then we didn't get the results until wow. today. Yeah. That is something truly to celebrate. So that's what that's we're amazing. celebrating today. I'm holding off on celebrating anything else except okay, for this today. Yeah. That, that's <laughs> pretty a pretty big one. thing. Yeah. That's a pretty big thing, if you ask me. How do you feel like you helped him through his fight? I think it was my dad is just like me. He's he's not an emotional person. He's super sarcastic. Um, I guess I should say I'm just like my You're dad. Just, yeah. I <laughs> am I am my daddy's girl. I will tell you that. I look like my mom, but just, I'm just like my dad. Yeah. And I think it was good for for my dad to be able to connect with me, but not to be emotional. The rest of my family is super emotional. I have three sisters. My mom, mm -hmm. they're all super emotional. So it was a good. It was good for my dad to be able to reach out to me and say, hey, this is, you know, kind of how I'm feeling, but in his own way and have that person that understood because otherwise my dad wouldn't have reached out to anybody. Yeah. How did you become the non-emotional one and three three women, <laughs> Latinas and Italian and all the things? Next to <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I was I, what I say is I'm lucky. Uh, my sisters call me the tin man, but I do have a heart. I promise. Was that <laughs> They, they think I'm the one that's the less emotional. And I'm like, y'all just have so much going on yeah, there that yeah, I'm like, yeah. but how did you, how did you keep your peace during your journey in that time where you knew it was heavy, right? Yeah. What you were telling them was heavy and the fear based mentality and all the things, the emotions get into play. How did you like protect yourself in that? Such a good question. And I, I tell this to all my newly diagnosed friends is that I gave myself time. I didn't want I what I didn't want people to to know me. I didn't want people to feel sorry for me. Mm -hmm. Right? So what I would do is for an hour from 2:30 to 3:30, I remember this. 2:30 I would go into a, a room and I would cry and I would be mad and I would be upset and I would yell and I would do all the things I need to do, but I would only do it from 2:30 to 3:30 because the rest of the time I needed to concentrate on healing myself and wow. feeling better. And if you get into this this emotion where all day you're crying and sad, that's gonna be your whole day the whole, you know, for the whole, you know, your whole life. So I'd give myself from 2.30 to 3.30 every single day. And then that changed from, all I needed was 30 minutes. And then that changed from every other day. And then that changed to weeks. And then eventually I just didn't need it anymore. Wow, I love that. Mm -hmm. That's a true power hour right there. Yeah. I need to implement that. <laughs> yeah. Like, husband, leave me in the room. I'm gonna. Yeah. I need some time. Just give me some time. Go There's to some... the kids' room. Yeah. Just throw all the toys around. Throw the toys, punch the wall, just like walk out and be like, hey, kids, clean up your room. Uh, yeah. I did that, but you got to clean. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow, that but is so you, good. I have a question. I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, do you feel as though almost like, you know, you mentioned that you were naive mm -hmm. to some of the situations? Yeah. Do you feel as though that kind of almost like helped you? Uh, absolutely. Like, I mean, like if the fact that you were just naive to the aspect of yeah. like, you mm -hmm. never, you honestly, you never thought that there was, death was possible for you. Right. I did. And I did. Do you feel I, that, that actually helped you? Absolutely. Because it, you know, had I had known that I had 25% chance of survival, mm -hmm. I think my outlook on life would have been a little bit different too. Yeah. I would have been nervous. I would have been scared. And, um, th thank goodness that, you know, I was blessed with a husband that was carrying that for me, mm. you know, that knew how important it was and that um, never had a weak moment to let me know that, you know, this is something that he was truly scared about because all I could focus on was just getting better. You know, that was my job is just to get better. So, yes, absolutely. And I think um, had if I was diagnosed with with cancer now, knowing all the stuff that I know that I know now, it would have been a lot more scary for me. Mm -hmm. You know, stage four is a scary thing. And I didn't realize how scary it was until after I was probably halfway through it. And when that's not something that you can just kind of teach to everybody right. else no. either, right? Right. Yeah. Sorry, Lisa. Timing is everything. No, you're fine. Um, oh, yeah. This could be a two-hour podcast. <laughs> I have so many questions. When, at what point did he tell you that they told him 25? After they told me I was cancer-free. He was like, I have, I've been, I've yeah. been carrying a so lot over here. Yeah. yeah. What a After man. After I was cancer free. Uh -huh. And he, he continued to go to my doctor's appointments with me for, until I told him to stop. I'm like, listen, you still ask too many questions and I already get anxiety being in there. So I'm going to have you to stop. I think it was probably maybe three years ago. He stopped going to my doctor's wow. appointments, but he was at every single one. Wow. Yeah. 
this is a little personal yeah. and <laughs> the trajectory of this interview, all the things, but I'm, I'm thinking about a newlywed mm -hmm. couple mm -hmm. and this being thrown into it. Did you guys have like a, a period of time where it was like almost a re newlywed stage, like post cancer of all the things you wanted to do together or yeah. anything like, does that make sense? I think we do that. I think we do that now. Um, okay. my, you know, he, thank goodness he was as strong as he was, right? Because that is that is a lot, especially for a marriage. And, you know, all marriages have their ups, ups and downs. But to get something like that right. in your first year of marriage was very difficult. My husband and I have known each other since we were 14, right? So, you know, we, we knew each other in and out before that. And, um, you know, there was a period in there where we were like, you know, we're talking about how, if we were going to still be able to have children or, what we, you know, we wanted children. Um, but now we like to say is we have date night every single night yeah <laughs> truly we can go you know we go to to pizza place have a bottle of wine we'll go on vacation we'll you know we'll drop you know for the weekend and we'll like head out to to napa or something and we truly have made up for not having that first couple of years of the honeymoon stage and you know we continue to do that every single every single I love week that. I love that. So, you don't have to ask for a babysitter. No. Nope. Enjoy all the wine we're, nights. <laughs> we're great aunties and uncles. Yes. And, and we, we do that and we give the children back and we just go about our day. I love that. <laughs> I love that for you. <laughs> Lena, honestly, like, have you written a book yet? Or is no, it coming? No, no book. Is that, is that going to happen? Maybe. I, we'll see. We'll see what that looks like. You heard it here. <laughs> you need to write a book. You need to be a speaker on every stage. Your story is so powerful. Thank you. And I hope Ed Milet is listening to this and then hires me and then you at the same time <laughs> sorry say for I don't mean that I mean <laughs> I want to stay here you know what I mean by that but your story is so profound and amazing and can impact so many so thank you for sharing your time with us thank you it's for an having honor me meeting you finally yeah in person yes we have a lot of connectivity <laughs> yeah we do absolutely well it won't be the last time and thank you for being a friend of state 48 for so long too of course Since 2017 y'all yeah appreciate it that's right all right we'll see y'all next week